thanks for coming in spite of the rains and heavy traffic. So, uh, since we have uh, not a big crowd, you know, it's easy for us to interact with each other. So, if you have any questions, stop me then and ask questions. So, my name is Manitra Sami, as I mentioned, and uh, I'm the co founder and CEO of Product School. Uh, now, for some of you who think CEO is a, is a fancy sounding term, you know, it, it has its own disadvantages. The disadvantage being when I go to a business conference, I get branded as a techie. When I come to a technology conference, I get branded as a businessman. So, when Zainab asked me to uh, talk about an introduction session on JS2, she asked me to talk about JavaScript for business. Now, I was kind of perplexed. You know? How do you talk about JavaScript for business? Because JavaScript is meant for programmers, right? So, I thought, you know, it is probably a good idea to understand what a business meant, right? A business exists because there is a usage in a particular domain, right? It could be in a vertical, like for example, e-commerce, or it could be in a technology domain like programming. Irrespective of that, there is a use for a programming language. And ultimately, based on the use, you are going to make money out of it. It might be as direct in the case of e-commerce, like for example, selling, or in the case of JavaScript, it could be by means of you know, uh, making the browser on all computers and therefore creating a mind share which will indirectly contribute to something like code for you. So ultimately, how does a technology get invented for a particular use case? Even a programming language, how does it get invented for a use case? And how does it solve and get adapted into multiple developer and uh, other perspectives is what I'm going to cover. Am I making sense here? So by that, I thought I would give you a perspective of how a program programming language creators will think and how as users we are being played among them right so these programming language creators you know try to have a certain use case on which the programming language is created and basically we are the users in fact we are somehow the buyers of this particular uh, programming language which the programming language creators yeah. Now, why am I making this such a big deal? Because ultimately, if you look at it, as technologies, we always forget that technologies are not on the sake of technology. It is not invented for the sake of technology. There should always be a problem which a technology problem should solve. I'll give you an example and why this company became such a big deal. Think about Google search. Right? Google search is a much better tool search engine than Yahoo. It wasn't the first search engine, but it was a much better search engine than Yahoo. The problem that they had was, they had to create the entire world's information indexed and sorted based on the popularity. I mean, it's called page rank, right? Based on the... And to store the entire world's data, they had to have so many data centers to store, and they have to have so many processing capacity to process that and rank it based on the page rank number. Right? That was the fundamental problem that they faced. To do a searching algorithm was the problem that they faced for Google search. And to do that, they created commodity servers which can store the entire world's data, right? which was in billions of pages. And they had to invent what we today call it as big data. Right? On top of the big table, they had to basically do search on an everyday basis to index and find the popularity. To that, they introduced the MapReduce white paper and they implemented MapReduce. Right? So, Google search was the problem that came first. It wasn't the big table and MapReduce, the ones that we, the technologists portray as the biggest invention of Google. But remember, once this was introduced, big table and MapReduce was introduced, it then scaled to multiple use cases. For example, if you, if you take an example of Google's new products like Google Apps, Google Docs, Google Sites, any any product that Google comes up with, it, with today, for example, even, even if you take the example of Google App Engine, okay, it takes the same technology that powered the use case of Google Search and then reinvented it for different problems, problem domains. Okay. Am I making sense to you? That is the success of Google. 
So initially, when you invent a technology, don't invent for the sake of technology. Invent it for the problem space, and then once the problem is solved, then look for other use cases to solve the problem. That is the success of a technology. And I will talk about how it relates to Java. Now, take another example. There is this beautiful technology called Google Wave. Most of you might remember it failed miserably. Why did it fail? It was a problem searching solution. What was the use case of Google Wave? Nobody could ever tell, right? It was a forum, it was a collaborative documentary thing. They never told you what it was meant for, right? All they could tell was the school things that technology could do, right? But ultimately it failed, or uh, even the name did not represent what problem it solved. They gave an ambiguous name called Google Pay. The same company which created Google Search, which became a huge success, had to create another technology for the sake of technology, but did not solve the problem, right? So, what problem did JavaScript solve? Scripting in the browser, perfect. Anything else? Hands are going any direction. I'm sorry, monkeys are going any direction. Monkeys are going any direction. <laughs> That's a fantastic one. So actually, if you look at any good uh, product naming, it comes from the underlying concept of the problem, right? Google search solves the problem of search. Google way doesn't know what, what problem it solves. Therefore, the name didn't have any problem accuracy, right? It did not represent the problem. JavaScript solved two problems. That is why it has the words Java and script. That is the thing, right? It solves the Java's right ones run anywhere problem, right? The Java applet was introduced as a mechanism. Remember, back in the olden days, Java was never a server-side language. It was pitched as a programming language for internet because you could compile it and run it anywhere it was actually pitched for applets right so that browsers can run very robust programs on any any browsers in any operating system right so when javascript was introduced it introduced as a mimicking programming language like java which can run anywhere in browsers that's the real use case of javascript right it was actually a marketing interest will come, come to act. Do you know which, which was the company which introduced JavaScript? Netscape. Netscape, right? So Netscape created this marketing terminology. Mark Anderson actually came up with this word called JavaScript. It wasn't actually called JavaScript earlier. We'll come to the history of it a little bit later. Right? So it actually solved Java's run anywhere uh, problem. So that was the real use case for Java. And the second one was JavaScript solved the DOM manipulation problem. HTML ultimately was a declarative programming, sorry, declarative language to create document models, right? So when you say HTML body and stuff like that, it creates this DOM model inside the browser. But when users have to interact with it and the model has to be changed dynamically based on the user interaction, right? For example, you click on a button and you need to show some uh, text in a particular uh, div then you are basically manipulating the DOM that is already created in the HTML in the browser, right? So when you want to manipulate that, you needed a scripting language, right? So it was meant to represent a very simpler form of programming language. So they didn't want to call it as language and, and sound scary for the people who are going to use it because the people who were intended for JavaScript, the people who who was the target audience wasn't really programmers. They were targeting it for HTML developers who are typically designers, right? So they wanted to extend HTML and then write smaller scripts inside HTML itself, right? So that was really the use case. So they didn't want to call it as a full fledged programming language, so they called it as script. In a way, it is demeaning to JavaScript, but the fact is they lived truthful to the use case that JavaScript solves. Run anywhere and scripting, which is easier to do. That's basically the concept which the programming language creators, in this case Netscape, came up with because that's what appealed to the users who will be using JavaScript. Now, 
quickly after JavaScript was introduced, it became pretty much a rage, you know, because most of the programming language uh, users started implementing it, at least started adopting it in Escape Browser. Quickly, uh, Microsoft adopted it and then came up with its own uh, version of JavaScript. They didn't call it as JavaScript. And then it became a pretty ubiquitous, I would say, scripting language, not programming language, but a scripting language that was used to manipulate DOM. So after the success of it, I mean, immediately after the release itself, Netscape came with this idea of Netscape Enterprise Server. Anybody remember Netscape Enterprise Server? So Netscape Enterprise Server uh, introduced JavaScript on server side so that you can write server side code, like for example, you could do persistence or you could do session management on the server using JavaScript as a programming language. But then it failed. You know why? Any guess? Problem. Problem statement not clear. Problem statement is not clear. True. And also there is a stigma attached with JavaScript already. When a programming language is already addressing a current prop, uh, market, it is not so easy to move away because a programming language is thought about from a use case. If you go back and look at almost all the tutorials and reference materials about JavaScript, it will invariably contain or the first hello world tutorial will be alert or document.body.html, right? It always intermingle with the DOM objects or the way in which you have to manipulate the browser's components in reality. Although JavaScript as a language is independent of the browser's object model, document object model, it was always used in conjunction with uh, the DOM object. In fact, if you think about it, people never thought JavaScript as a language itself. Right? They thought it's an additional add-on to document object model. To think JavaScript as a language and you can use JavaScript independent of document object model in HTML itself was perplexing to the users that you could use it for storing data inside the server or use it for session management is something that is unknown, right? So you, you have to remember whenever you target a particular use case, there is always a problem associated with it. You can't move away from that, from that market unless another use case is clearly established and the value proposition is established. I'll come back to that a little bit later. Just to make sure you know you don't uh, you don't get bored or fall into sleep. I just have a set of questions to ask so that we, we come back alive when you know you can probably interact more. Here are the questions that I have. First question: What is JavaScript's original name? Livescript. Livescript so, is the original name. So Livescript was the actual name that was coined by Netscape. Uh, and then uh, finally when Java became a rage in the market, they named it as JavaScript instead of Livescript. So, second question, how did Sun allow a phony name? How did it allow Java to be attached to script? Sun was the trademark of Java. Java yeah, there is a history behind how they owned the uh, trademark of JavaScript. How did it first allow? Because Netscape when they introduced JavaScript, how did they allow? Yeah, so there was a deal stuck between uh, Netscape and Sun Microsystem. So what happened was Microsoft was always this bully, right? Uh, you know, Sun Microsystem and uh, Netscape feared that Microsoft will again come I mean, At that time, Microsoft was the biggest deal with them. It was the one of them. And uh, we had this one of the case which uh, Sun filed against uh, Microsoft right after they destroyed Netscape Navigator. But at that time, Microsoft was the biggest company in the world. It was called monopoly and evil and all the epic names in the world. But what happened was Sun wanted this Java to be an ubiquitous write once anywhere platform, write once and anywhere platform by bundling applet inside every browser that is there in the world. Right. So they wanted Netscape to bundle Java along with their browser. And in return, Netscape navigated. Sorry, Netscape uh, uh, negotiated that Livescript be named as JavaScript. Right? So Sun allowed that. In fact, the deal almost fell apart when when uh, uh, when Netscape tried to use the Java way to 
write for uh, live script the deal almost fell apart finally they allowed uh, netscape to use that name so java was bundled the browser was reload i don't know if anybody used that version of netscape it was the most buggiest and slowest version ever i think it was netscape 7 or something 6 or something like that it was the it was the most slowest version of netscape and uh, that is how java script as a name was allowed in the first place third question why did microsoft call it j script instead of java script Sun want so one year after they allowed uh, JavaScript, Sun said Java as a name was won by them, and then they claimed the trademark for JavaScript. So Microsoft then decided, you know, they will not use this word JavaScript because it was already under litigation. So Microsoft decided to call it as JavaScript. It wasn't because Microsoft wanted, you know, everybody thinks that Microsoft always wants to create a non-standard. Right? It wants to break the standard. It wasn't the reason. The reason really was Microsoft wasn't that 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 big an evil at that particular point in time. It created JavaScript because of litigation reasons. Fourth one. Oh, the question should be why are why are variables globally scoped in JavaScript? And most of you, how many of you are already Java programmers? JavaScript programmers. Anybody who is not a JavaScript programmer, let me ask you that question. Okay, everybody is a JavaScript. Programmer. You know that uh, this is a common problem that we all face. You include two scripts, and you declare one variable there, and you declare the same variable in another script. Especially if you are using another third-party library, you don't even have control over what is the uh, what is the JavaScript that you are importing and what is the variable that they are going to use. Right? It clashes with the variables that uh, you have defined in the other script. Right? It's a pretty buggy implementation, actually. If you think about it, it's. It actually reflects on the design principle. How poorly JavaScript was designed in the first place, right? How did they allow that? How did they allow? Why didn't they allow scoping based on the JavaScript files imported at least? It would have been much easier to solve. Too complicated for designers. Too complicated for designers. When they introduced, they never thought of uh, implementing import for JavaScript in the first place. They introduced only scripting part of the HTML language. So they used to put script language JavaScript, and and they used to have the script, right? So it was always declared as variables, uh, sorry, global scoping. When they introduced, when JavaScript became quite popular, and then when they introduced including of uh, JavaScript as separate file system, uh, they couldn't, they would break, uh, they they had to break the backward compatibility to introduce another scope. So what happened was Microsoft. So the Sun Sun came into this trademark violation, and Microsoft and Netscape went to a standard body in Europe uh, to do the standardization. Right? Actually, ECMA uh, ECMA script came after JavaScript. Actually speaking, it wasn't the predecessor to uh, the standardization came to JavaScript later, not earlier. Right? When JavaScript was introduced, it wasn't ECMA, ECMA script uh, uh, specification of right? it. Only later it came. So they went to this European manufacturer and they started uh, doing this uh, uh, specification for JavaScript. When they did that, one of the common flaws that they found was this uh, global scoping problem because most of the time when when uh, they import multiple files of uh, JavaScript into the application, but even then they had to leave it as such because if they remove global scoping and move it to a file scoping or to individual scoping, then it would break the backward compatibility. So one of the most common design flaws that exists today in uh, JavaScript includes this global scoping. Any other problems that you know of as uh, JavaScript design problems? Semicolon insertion. Anything else? Okay, JavaScript has a, a couple of. Uh, uh, You know, design flaws, which is inherent because it was introduced much earlier, as uh, Kiran mentioned. Uh, it was introduced based on the use case. It wasn't a properly or fully thought through language. It was designed for a use case, and then it evolved before even the language uh, became fully mature. So it became popular before it became mature. So namespacing, yeah, namespacing is the solution for global scoping problem. So it was never uh, names. Namespacing was never part of. Everything was globally scoped, so that's a that's a big problem as, as we talked about. So, what is JavaScript? Is it is it an object-oriented programming language or functional programming language? How many of you think it's an object-oriented programming language? 
How many of you think it's a function programming language? Same set of function okay. It's an intersection. Okay. So yeah, I mean, uh, it's kind of funny because although the name sounds like Java and the syntax sounds like Java, JavaScript is really not an object-oriented programming language. It is kind of object-oriented programming language. Actually speaking, you know, uh, in those days, if you think about two characteristics, you wouldn't think it's an object-oriented programming language in the first place. The first one being, uh, uh, you know, any programming language had to have, any object-oriented programming language has to have this concept of class, and then you have the uh, uh, you have the instance of the class, which are objects, basically. Okay? Uh, in, in reality, <coughs> JavaScript never has this uh, concept of class in the first place. What JavaScript even inherits is even what objects are inherited from is actually not a class, it's another object. Right? So in reality, class paradigm itself doesn't exist. So you can't really call it as an object-oriented programming language with just that one characteristic. Right? The second one which is very interesting is, uh, uh, you know, uh, JavaScript doesn't differentiate between an ab object and an array, yeah? more like a hash table, right? Both are same actually speaking. Uh, you know why it is why it is not uh, why it is not compliant with the object oriented paradigm. It's a very interesting feature though. It's a very powerful feature though. Uh, you know, for example, if you can uh, create an object and then use it as a hash table, or you can use it you can create a hash table and then use it like an object. Like for example, you, you get a JSON or JSON string, right? Uh, how many of you have used JSON here? Most of you. Right? So if you get a JSON, what you actually create is more like a uh, array, right? Uh, a, a, a hash array of uh, name and values. Uh, but it's possible that you can dynamically attach a behavior uh, to that uh, map or a hash table, right? And then it suddenly starts behaving like an object. It's a, it's a very powerful feature if you really think about it, right? I, I think some of these uh, new programming languages uh, that has this MVC architecture uses that very powerful that you can take the uh, JSON data structure and create a model out of it, model out of it with behavior attached to it. So it's a very important feature. Uh, so it, it is not really an object pro programming language, but it has a lot of features of uh, and syntax of Java and it looks almost like object pro programming language. In fact, if you search for object oriented JavaScript, you'll have tons of tutorials. So you could say, you could argue either way that JavaScript is, is an object oriented programming language as well. You would be wrong. And uh, it is a functional programming language as well, right? Uh, if you think about it. In, in, in fact, it's called as a poor man's functional programming language. Right? It has closure, which was pretty, uh, I would say, uh, pretty different uh, uh, at that time. You know, the reason why they probably introduced functional programming languages, maybe just because of this concept of closure, especially if you're using uh, asynchronous JavaScript, right? Uh, if you are uh, sending uh, a data and then you want to access that when you write into another function which is responding to the data asynchronously, uh, closure gives you a very simpler way to access data across functions. Right? So functional programming language is probably the more appropriate terminology to explain JavaScript as a programming language. Now, uh, once this particular uh, programming language became a very popular scripting language, uh, you know, it was branded as a designer's extension, right? right? Uh, uh, you know, it was more like, you know, it was meant for HTML developers, hardcore developers will never touch it. And it's, it's, a, it's a toy language, you don't want to use that, especially, you know, in, in those days when we were there, you know, becoming old probably. <laughs> in, those, in those days when we used to program, you know, uh, we used to program in Java I and mean, if you have to write code in JavaScript, you are considered like you know, second class in the sense in, in development world. I mean, uh, you know, that's because it had the stigma uh, that, you know, it can be used only for simpler purposes in Java, uh, in, in, in browser, as you mentioned, for modules scrolling left, right, center, right, top, down, bottom, right, that, that's kind of uh, use case in which JavaScript was used for. Uh, and anything that was serious, if you had to develop a rich client application, especially, you know, uh, uh, Java was positioned like that. Uh, you know, if you have to create a chat application in those days, you have to download a Java application, it will come with a gray screen, and after five minutes, it will load 
okay, Java applet window for games or even for your chat window. So even at those days, if you had to use it for serious purpose, you had to use Java. But then Microsoft created this uh, J++ version and it went into a litigation and they filled the entire Java version of browsers. So Java became pretty much obsolete on browsers, right? In fact, if you, if you read the latest news uh, last week, Java, which, which was the original use case of Java to run anywhere on browsers, is pretty much dead. Today, Java is considered a security threat in browsers, right? Pretty much every hacker in the world is using Java as a way to hack into your system. So Java has pretty much dead, you know, it started in those days, but it's pretty much the death. Death will has been completed with last week, I guess, right? So once Java died in that new course, there was another programming language which came, which was Flash, right? So a lot of people started using it for rich application. In fact, a lot of business applications was, were also developed on, on top of Flash because it was, a, it was at least a robust platform. It wasn't fragmented like JavaScript which run halfway through in Netscape and then you have to run it halfway through in uh, IE and then you have to run it across some 7 browsers uh, in IE, sorry, 7 versions in IE and 6 versions in Netscape Navigator. It was pretty impossible task. So at least Flash gave a single code base in which you can work on with a consistent way of uh, behaving, right? So that was the reason why Flash was adopted mainstream. So Flash programming language, especially with action, was considered a decent programming language on the client side in browser in those days. Right? JavaScript was never considered a decent programming language. That's when, when all hope was lost, Gmail came up with this fantastic application. Right? Gmail was the first powerful application which showed the use case of Ajax in the client side. While you know people were trying out very cool things by communicating HTML, uh, sorry, XML communication between the server and the client side, it was never considered a serious programming language. And until Gmail established that it would pretty much replicate a very powerful client, like for example Outlook, into the browser environment. Right. So when Gmail came and recreated uh, the Outlook environment on the browser with the performance that they had, that is when Ajax became a predominant use case and Google as it had the brand value recreated the market and people slowly started seeing JavaScript as a powerful programming language on uh, the browser. Right? So you would see that a lot of new technology, especially when they started off with uh, XML as a communication was also replaced with the native JavaScript data structure which is JSON in that case. That's, that's the time in which JSON was also popularized. So, if you think about Ajax, the X was completely replaced with JSON in, in new course, right? And I mean, uh, if you remember uh, the XML as a predominant communication in those days, as he mentioned, both XML as well as XHTML was pushed for the name of technology. Right? It didn't have a strong use case, but people want to standardize, it didn't work, right? So, Ultimately, JSON took over as a standard in Ajax applications. Now, the final verdict on Flash was done by this single guy. He wrote the final verdict for Flash. Basically, he said iPhone and iPad will not support Flash, and uh, the death was basically. Right? So, uh, pretty much the standardization from JavaScript uh, went into HTML5, and uh, once HTML5 uh, was declared as a programming programming language along with JavaScript as the handwritten language, then Flash was completely replaced by HTML. And it sounds like uh, a paradox when you think that the phone gap uh, was bought by Adobe uh, in, the, in the last year. Right? So once they completed the first episode of capturing the entire browser market, they had both the developer support as well as designers. So there was huge skill set. Right? This is when you see programming languages or technologies adopting new market because now you have skill set and you can commoditize the skill set to develop applications in other markets. The next popular market was naturally uh, mobile. Right? So people started writing Objective C and Java. I mean, Java at least is understandable. But you know, Objective C is kind of uh, 
I can't, I can't, I can't imagine why this guy would come up with something called objectivity and throw us back into the Stone Age. But essentially, uh, at, at that point in time, skill set became a problem. So JavaScript became a skill set commoditization uh, market, right? So they were able to use the JavaScript programmers, and then they were able to give both cross compilation, which Titanium did, to compile it into uh, the iOS application or into an Android application. Or for example, PhoneGap, which essentially mimicked the browser environment inside your mobile. So basically, it had uh, the next popular market in, in its data. So basically, it, 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 it completed the browser market and it entered into the mobile market. Sooner or later, we will see mobile overtaking. Or I think even now, mobile will be overtaking. Uh, you know, desktops as a popular browser. So the third one is basically revenge of the server side, right? So if you think about uh, the full circle that JavaScript came, especially if you think about uh, you know how Netscape uh, Enterprise Server was introduced. In fact, if you think about even JavaScript was introduced on IAS, right? Uh, anybody anybody has written uh, I you know uh, ASP code with JScript here? <laughs> back, back in, I think it was around 15 years back, probably. Right. So uh, IAS had multiple versions. You could write it on uh, script or you could write it on uh, JScript as well on the server side. So you can ma manipulate, you know, um, ADO objects, especially for data storage, uh, using uh, JScript. So JScript, in fact, was slightly popular than Netscape Enterprise Server. I mean, enterprise server was also decent, but you know, it never took off. From that, if you really think about Node.js today, an invented IO server, uh, it took off the, uh, you took the innovations that were created in the Chrome browser, especially, right? So, V8 Engine came up with this very fast browser implementation of uh, uh, JavaScript. In fact, quite a lot of uh, JavaScript that was uh, uh, JavaScript competition uh, which improved JavaScript market between uh, Netscape and Microsoft pretty much stopped after Netscape was killed. Right? So if you think about IE 3.0 to uh, 6.0, uh, the innovation would have been uh, instead of mark you coming from left to right, you would have been from top to bottom. That is all the innovation that happened in the browser. Right? So no innovation was made on the JavaScript. Only when Chrome browser came in. I think there was a project called Iron Monkey on uh, Firefox which tried to do the compilation thing. Uh, and, and I think before that there was Spider Monkey also. But essentially, uh, the V8 uh, uh, engine that came along with uh, the Chrome browser really made the JavaScript innovation and competition back into the game. So the uh, Node.js uh, uses that innovation to bring faster JavaScript on the source. Right? In fact, if you think about the older JavaScript implementation on Netscape Enterprise Server, they were the slowest ones. If you will execute for half an hour, we could even get the results. So, Node.js is basically an implemented server. Uh, is there a session on Node.js? So, this session, basically what you are seeing today, uh, the Ajax, the mobile, uh, the Node.js, and then the next one that I will talk about, all the four uh, are basically introduction discussions to uh, the next speakers. So, uh, uh, Sid will be talking about uh, uh, Ajax and then we will, we will have a discussion on the mobile applications. And then uh, the server side is not there, probably for that in the main session to be able to understand uh, the mobile JS. Right. So that's basically on the server side. Uh, it will be basically used and uh, even today so some of you have used uh, Twisted Python or something like that because essentially uh, all this uh, dynamic programming language with uh, no threading has this weird uh, way of working, right? So you have to wait. Uh, so let's say, for example, there is a network operation. Uh, if a network operation happens, you are not really doing anything on your server, uh, but then uh, uh, the process will still not process another upcoming request, right? So, uh, event -ed server allows you to use that. Uh, IO time or uh, network IO time uh, to process other requests. So even that IO server is going to be to uh, do scalability by using uh, you know, uh, dynamically type programming languages like JavaScript. 
finally, this is the uh, verdict that tells you how successful JavaScript is. Uh, the, 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 the giant which actually stopped the innovation of the JavaScript finally came back and said for the skill set purpose, they will use HTML and JavaScript as a main way to develop Windows 8 application. If you think about it, it's a, it's a, it tells you how much of adoption that JavaScript has gone mainstream and it's not just anymore a, a designer's language, how important it is in, in day to day programming language. If you think about the amount of adoption it has had, either in serious client side programming languages on the web or on the server side programming language or on the mobile application development, it has pretty much taken over the entire world. So, today, if you are thinking about it as a programmer or in my age, if we had to think about JavaScript as a puny or a pony language, in your age, JavaScript is a tool without which you can't live, right? As a programmer, you still have to learn JavaScript. At least, even if you are not going to code in HTML, you still need to understand because it's the primary communication medium between the browser and server side. And the, the uh, Windows 8 Metro platform is a reminder of the fact that how far JavaScript is an important programming language for each of our lives. So, with that, let me summarize what I spoke about here today. Sorry, till now. Use case determines the success of technology. So, JavaScript was successful, the meteoric rise of JavaScript can be attributed only to its use case, Java and script use case. The ability to run anywhere and, and the ability to make it very easy. Right? It, it was a programming language which wasn't mature uh, when it became popular, but still it was successful. Just like think about Google, think about, uh, you know, even if you think about Apple's iTunes, right? Steve Jobs knew that he is going to come up with iPhone and he is going to come up with uh, iPad when he released iPod. But still he named it as iTunes. He could have named it as a sync software, right? He could have, could have synced both music application as well as something else, right? You think about Nap why Napster was successful. And you could call it as FTP. You could have done more than music syncing. Uh, you know, just like iTunes, you know, he named it. Uh, as iTunes because it had to solve that one use case for iPod. JavaScript was successful because of that one use case it solved perfectly well. It wasn't because it was technologically superior, it was the most buggy implementation and it was produced. But it scaled well. Even though it wasn't mature, it became popular. After it became popular, it matured well. So once it became mature, then it was able to go to other use cases, especially when Gmail came in, the Ajax use case became mainstream. That's where scalability of a technology comes in. Similar to Google, think about Google. Google had this great search use case, but without uh, the big table and map reduce implementation, Google wouldn't have been such a big company with so many projects, sorry, products successful without the underlying technology. A company becomes successful for a, because of a certain use case, but a company scales big because of the underlying technology. That's basically the business perspective you try to say that I have to bring in for JavaScript. Right? Finally, mobile made it all per, made it as an all pervasive client side language, and basically more JS improved on the V8 <coughs> innovation. So we will have a, 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 a sorry, I'll complete with Microsoft, uh, you know, making the victory complete for JavaScript. So with that, uh, you know, I will introduce uh, Sid and uh, we will have, uh, Sid will be talking about the Ajax use case and uh, uh, you know, then we will have the mobile use case uh, using the right hand phone. So I think more of that.